very much. Thank you for the. Oops. Yep. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I will talk about rigidity results for LP operator algebras, and this is joint work with Yemen Choi and Oisibio Cadella. So let me start by introducing the objects that we want to study. Uh, we pick a Hölder exponent p somewhere between one and infinity. Usually it's not two. And then we say uh, that an LP operator algebra is a Banach algebra that admits an isometric representation as operators on some LP space. Yeah? And this is, of course, uh, meant to generalize the notion of uh, C-star algebras, which are uh, Banach algebras, which admit isometric representations on Hilbert spaces. Um, so um, what are the examples of these uh, Banach algebras that we want to look at? So the, the typical example, and um, of course, somehow all the examples are the closed sub-algebras of the algebra of bounded operators on some LP space. And uh, here, um, um, I think you see my mouse, I hope. So uh, we can, of course, for instance, consider the space little LP, but we also allow the space uh, big LP and all other kinds of LP spaces on other measure, measure spaces. Uh, and uh, OK, more interestingly, maybe uh, more concrete classes of uh, Banach algebras that we can represent like this are actually the commutative C-star algebra C of x, um, uh, which are the continuous functions on some compact house of space, uh, which we represent as multiplication operators uh, on a suitable LP space. Um, more interested, more interesting are the uh, group algebras that we get from a discrete group G. These were um, first introduced by Hertz in the 70s. They are uh, massively studied in abstract harmonic analysis. And um, they were not originally called reduced group LP operator algebras. So this terminology goes back to, to Chris Phillips. They were originally called uh, algebras of P pseudo functions. Uh, but let me, let me stick to this new naming convention. And so what are these Banach algebras? You start with a group G and you consider the left regular representation of this group on the space little lp of G, now where the, the group just acts by translation. And these, um, these translation operators, these isometries, lambda G, we take them all together and we look at the closed linear span of that. So that's a, a nice Banach algebra and we call it FP lambda. Um, and this algebra encodes uh, in some sense the representation theory of the group on LP spaces. And it's very interesting to see somehow what properties of the group are reflected and how they are reflected in this Banach algebra. And then uh, we can go one step further, and this was done by uh, Chris Phillips in 2012. We can associate to a dynamical system of a group G acting on a, a compact house of space X, uh, a LP operator algebra uh, called the cross product. And the notation here will be FP lambda uh, GX. So that's a, a Banach algebra, uh, which has, um, well, a representation on some LP space uh, and somehow it uh, well is built out of uh, operators, multiplication operators coming from C of X and translation operators of G that interact in a, in a way that is encoded by the action. And uh, again, here for these Banach algebras, it is very interesting uh, to see what properties of the dynamical system uh, they encode and how. And uh, lastly, I also wanna mention the uh, LP Kunz algebras so these were also introduced by Phillips uh, in 2012. So these are very specific and very important uh, Banach algebras. Uh, the notation is OP2. And these are Banach algebras of operators on little LP. And they generalize the famous uh, Kunz c star algebras. OK, so um, what are rigidity results that I'm thinking about. So a uh, first one 
that I want to mention here is a result together with Gardella, uh, which is a uh, very strong rigidity result for groups. So the setting is we have two discrete groups, G and H, and a Hölder exponent, which is not two. Then the group uh, Banach algebras, FP lambda G and FP lambda H, are isomorphic. And here I mean uh, isometrically isomorphic as Banach algebras. This happens precisely if and only if G and H are isomorphic as groups. Now, and so what this means is that all the information about the group G is encoded in the Banach algebra. Um, and of course, this fails uh, dramatically for P equals two. Um, we know that uh, for P equals two, these Banach algebras are nothing but the group C star algebras, so usually denoted by C star lambda. And we know, for instance, uh, if we take um, yeah, the group with two elements and the uh, direct product with itself, this C star algebra is just as uh, four copies of the complex numbers and it's the same C star algebra as if you take the group uh, with uh, the cyclic group with four elements. And yet these two groups are not isomorphic. So um, there's really a difference between the case P equals two and P not equals two. And this brings me now to the, the main rigidity result um, of this talk, which was then uh, obtained together with, with Yemen also and uh, Ozzy Burgadella. Uh, and it says that if you have uh, free, uh, topologically free actions of discrete groups on compact house of spaces, and again, we have to exclude the Hölder exponent two, then the cross product Banach algebras, FP lambda GX and FP lambda HY, they are isometrically isomorphic if and only if the actions are what is called continuously orbit equivalent. Now, so this tells us that uh, for these kind of dynamical systems, we know precisely what kind of information uh, is encoded in the Banach algebra. So let me first uh, maybe remind you of what topo topologically free means. So first maybe free means that uh, you pick a point in your space X and you look at the orbit uh, that the group G um, induces at that point. And if the orbit is full, uh, meaning that the stabilizer group is trivial, um, and if this happens at every point, then it's a free action. And if this happens only at a dense set of points, we call it a topologically free action. Um, right. And then what is this notion here, continuously orbit equivalent? This means that the spaces X and Y are homeomorphic. Uh, by some fixed, by fixed homeomorphism. And that homeomorphism also is supposed to identify the orbits. Uh, so if I pick a point in X and that G act, I get an orbit and I move this over to Y and let H act there, I get the same uh, orbit. And if you have such an orbit equivalence, it comes with uh, co-cycles. And these co-cycles are supposed to be uh, continuous. And this is just what this word continuously here um, refers to. And I also want to mention that this also fails for P equals two. Um, it's not, okay, I mean, there are examples and here I wrote one down, they're not as easy as with the groups. Um, but, uh, so let me sketch you uh, how one would do that. So you need to, for instance, use that there is a, a topologically free action uh, of a group on a space. So one can take here an, essentially a free group and a counter space such that the reduced cross product is uh, the Kuhn C star algebra O2. And then if you take any minimal topological free action uh, of any group actually on any space X, um, and then I consider the, the direct uh, action of F times G on C times X, uh, you always get the same C star algebra. And that's, uh, a consequence of the um, yeah, or true absorption theorem. And uh, so you always get the same C star algebra here, while um, these dynamical systems here are not continuously orbit equivalent because continuous orbit equivalence implies in particular that the spaces are homeomorphic. 
Oh, is there a question? No. Um, While well, you can come up with examples where these spaces are not homomorphic. Um, okay, so again, here also in this rigidity uh, result, the uh, case P equals two has to be excluded for sure. So let me now um, explain to you uh, how we prove this theorem. And for this, we had to develop some um, yeah, new concepts. Uh, and these concepts I will explain to you now. So the first one is that of a C star core. Uh, and that works uh, um, in fair generality. If you have any uh, unital LP operator algebra, and uh, then we show that there always exists a largest C star subalgebra. Uh, and well, we call it the C star core. Uh, and we use this notation here, core of A. And if P is not equal to two, then this is automatically commutative. Yeah, so you always get somehow uh, a canonical commutative uh, sub C star algebra. And I mean, the idea, let me sketch it uh, in the case that P is not true. Uh, we represent A on some LP space and we look at the so-called Hermitian elements, uh, which are generalizations of self-adjoint elements in the C-star algebra. Um, and we see that the Hermitian elements in A um, uh, are nothing but the intersection of A with the Hermitian elements uh, in the containing Banach algebra. And now we use uh, that P is not equal to two, to know that Hermitian operators on an LP space are nothing but multiplication operators by some real valued um, bounded function on the measure space. And from this, we see immediately that the set of Hermitian operators in A is closed under multiplication. Now, this is, of course, very special here for the case P not equal to. Uh, and then one can see that the core in this case is actually just um, yeah, the Hermitian elements plus items to Hermitian elements. And this turns out to be a commutative C-star algebra. Um, and let's see some examples. So if, if you take these group algebras, um, then the core is just uh, the complex numbers, not the multiples of the identity. Uh, if you take uh, a dynamical system and look at the core of this Banach algebra, the cross product, then you get back C of X. Um, and if you take the like, LP Kunz algebra, you get uh, continuous functions on the Cantor space. And you can see here already that some of this core um, yeah, reflects um, yeah, some part of the underlying dynamics of, uh, of the Banach algebra. And the next step, um, so somehow we can say we recovered here the space X from the cross product, and now we wanna recover also the action. And this is uh, what we do next. Um, for this, we use uh, groupoids. Uh, and again, this works in uh, uh, fair generality. So if we take any uh, unital LP operator algebra, and we now already that it has a uh, yeah, yeah, very special uh, commutative sub algebra, uh, namely the C star core, then we define a notion of uh, realizable partial homeomorphisms on that uh, spectrum of that subsister algebra. We say that a partial homeomorphism, so that's a homeomorphism between open subsets U and V of my space X, we say that is realizable in A, if there exist uh, two operators A and B that satisfy now uh, certain technical conditions. Um, yeah, let me go through them. Quickly, so if I have a positive function on X, uh, then A of B and B of A should also be uh, positive functions on X. In particular, if I take the constant function one, it means A, B and B, A uh, are uh, positive functions on X. And this, so this condition here is some kind of normalization condition. Yeah? Um, then secondly, I want that the points where B, A is strictly positive, this should be my U. And conversely, where AB is strictly positive, this should be my V. And then I want, well, that A and B really um, yeah, implement this partial homeomorphism. And this, these are these uh, formulas here that are supposed to be satisfied. 
and um, well, the the object that we associate to this is uh, what we call the Val group read, and we follow more or less the uh, convention of uh, Renault that was introduced uh, in the context of sister algebras. And the Val group read of this Banach algebra is the group read, which we denote by G sub A. Uh, and it's the group read of germs associated to the inverse semigroup of realizable partial homeomorphisms uh, on X. Okay, so I don't have the time to go into detail and explain uh, what this is. So, um, uh, but it's it's somehow a, a naturally associated group read uh, to the Spanach algebra. And the main point is that if you start with a topologically free action and you form the cross product, and then of that cross product, you look at the vile group read, then you get back the transformation group read of your action. Yeah. So this is really, uh, this is a, a difficult deep uh, structure result about um, cross product uh, LP operator algebras. And with this theorem uh, at hand, I will show you how we get the rigidity result. Um, so let me first uh, restate it. So we, we start with two topologically free actions of discrete groups uh, on compact house of spaces and an exponent which is not true. And now I already uh, uh, here state three equivalent conditions. So first is that the cross product Banach algebras are isomorphic. Second is that the uh, transformation group reads are isomorphic. And the third one is that the actions are continuously orbit equivalent. Uh, and then, well, the step from one to two, this is what we, uh, what I showed you on the previous slide, some of how to get this. So we assume that the cross product Banach algebras are isomorphic. This implies that their vial group reads are isomorphic. Now, because the vial group read, and that's, that's the main point, is really uh, built or constructed out of the Banach algebra structure. Yeah? Um, and then the vial group read of the first cross product is just uh, the transformation group read G times X. And the y group rate of the other Banach algebra is uh, the transformation group rate h times y. And then, so these are uh, isomorphic. So this is the implication from one to two. <coughs> and the converse, uh, one would think that it's kind of obvious, but it's actually uh, not trivial, it's surprisingly difficult. In the CISTA algebra setting, uh, this would be just a remark, but it turns out that in the case of LP operator algebras, uh, one has to work hard. And the, the problem is that one has to show that certain norms that you get uh, from the uh, LP operator algebra naturally associated to a group read, that it's the same norm as if you consider the cross product. But it can be done and we did it. And so this gives you the equivalence between one and two. And the equivalence between two and three now, that's, uh, I would say, classical. And you can actually see there's no piece here anymore, right? I mean, it's just uh, transformation group reads are isomorphic or uh, some actions are orbit equivalent. This has nothing to do with LP. Uh, this goes back to work of uh, Jean Renard and uh, Shinli. Okay. So with this um, rigidity result at hand, I want to give you uh, one nice application and that's to these um, LP Kunz algebras. So I wanna first recall um, a little bit more detail what these are. So I wanna choose as a starting point, uh, the Levitt algebras. And these are uh, now just um, not Banach algebras, these are just um, a normal algebras. So un universal complex algebra uh, given by generators and relations. And the generators are S1, S2, T1 and T2. And the relations here, uh, what do they mean? So the first one here, T1, S1, should be one, means in some sense that S1 is an isometry. T1 is the corresponding co-isometry. Uh, same for S2 and T2. And we want that the 
um, item potents that I get when I multiply S1 with T1 and the other item potent that these add up to one. Yeah, okay. Um, and then I also want to... Uh, is there a question? Okay, someone needs to mute their microphone, I think. Um, <laughs> um, and then we have this, this condition here, T1, S2, and T2, S1 should be zero. <coughs> now, um, what is the Kunz algebra O2? <clears throat> it's the completion of this uh, algebra for a norm that you get by representing uh, this algebra on a Hilbert space. And one doesn't just take any representation, one takes a representation uh, which uh, takes the image of uh, SJ to the edge joint of the image of TJ. And then this makes, uh, yeah, these pi of SJ and pi of TJ makes them partial uh, isometries. And uh, what Kunz, of course, showed is that uh, every such representation gives you the same norm on L2, and you complete in this norm and you get a, a nice uh, C star algebra, and that's called O2. And um, Phillips generalized this um, uh, to all Ps, and <clears throat> he considered a, a special type of representations on this uh, algebra on LP spaces, and these are called spatial representations. And I'm also not going to go into detail what, what this means, but it's somehow the, you should think of it as like the, the generalization of this uh, property here. But of course, we have no star. Uh, we have no adjoint uh, of operators on LP spaces. Uh, so one has to uh, do something different. Um, but one can then still show, and, and this is what Chris did, that uh, independent of which spatial representation one uses, one always gets the same norm on the Levitt algebra. And if I complete in this norm, I get a nice uh, LP operator algebra. And uh, I call it the uh, LP Kunz algebra. Uh, o to P. Um, and one of the main results in C star classification theory is Elliot's theorem, which says that uh, this Kunz algebra O2 has the peculiar property of being self absorbing, tensorially self absorbing, uh, meaning that O2, tensor O2, is isomorphic to O2. Uh, so um, this is. It's, an, it's a very non-trivial result. Um, and it naturally sparks the question uh, raised by Phillips, whether this also works for these Banach algebras, uh, the LP generalizations of the Kunz algebra. And here one has to be careful with the tensor products that one uses. So uh, here in C-star algebras, it's, the, it's a C-star algebra tensor product. And uh, for LP operator algebras, one has to use some kind of um, yeah, tensor product that works for, for these kind of Banach uh, algebras. And right, so this is a natural question whether this uh, works. And uh, with our methods, we were able to answer this question uh, negatively. Namely, if P is not two, then there is no uh, isomorphism uh, between this tensor product of the LP Kunz algebra with itself and the LP Kunz algebra. Um, and I want to sketch to you uh, the proof, uh, how we use our rigidity result to deduce this. So the idea is to realize the Kunz algebra as a cross product. And for this, we need to know that this is possible. And so this, I think to some experts it's probably known, but maybe not as well known uh, that one can actually find a uh, an action of, well, this free product of Z mod two and Z mod three, which is more or less a, a free group on two generators up to finite index, and an action of this group on the Cantor space X, such that the corresponding uh, cross product is just um, the Kunz algebra. Um, okay, so we will use this, of course. Um, we will use then also that for this action, if we take this action and um, 
yeah, use it twice. Yeah, so take the action of G times G on X times X, the, the diagonal action here. The cross product that I get from this, this is just the tensor product of uh, two copies of the Kunz algebra. And then the, the third ingredient is a uh, result of Medinet, Sauer, and Tom, uh, who showed that two groups are by Lipschitz equivalent if and only if they admit continuously orbit equivalent actions on compact Hausdorff spaces. Okay, and we will now use all these ingredients together and argue by contradiction. So assume that there is uh, such an isomorphism, isometric isomorphism um, between the tensor product of O2 with itself and O2. I realize the left-hand side here as a cross product of G times G on X times X. And uh, the other side is just a cross product for the action of G on X. And now using our rigidity, rigidity result, we get that, um, well, this diagonal action of G times G on X times X is continuously orbit equivalent to the action on G on X. Okay, so far so good. Uh, applying the result of Medinet, Sauer, and Tom, this tells us that um, G times G and G are by Lipschitz equivalent. But these groups are um, um, the free product of Z2 and Z3. Uh, and these are, uh, as I already said, more or less just the free groups on two generators. And uh, it is known that these are not by Lipschitz equivalent. Yeah, so the, the free product, uh, the free group on two generators times itself is not by Lipschitz equivalent to the free group on two generators. And the same argument shows you also that these two groups here are not by Lipschitz equivalent. Uh, I would say this is uh, well known in geometric group theory. Uh, one concrete way of seeing that this is not true is that you compute the so-called asymptotic dimension. And it's uh, one on the, for this group and it's two for the other. Uh, so this is a contradiction. Uh, and this gives us, uh, well, that these two Banach algebras uh, are not isomorphic. So that's it. Thank you very much. And here are the references. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see you have a, a question. Um, no, do you have a question? No, yes, uh, there is a... Uh... Yeah. Hannes? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Would you go to the preceding page? What happens if you assume uh, just, uh, I, uh, can, can these spaces, uh, the, 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 the tensor product of, of the P Kuntz algebra with itself be, uh, be isomorphic as a Bonnach algebra to it? Um, so we, we don't know this. I, I suspect that not. Uh, but the, uh, the methods that we have at the moment are not sufficient to, out, uh, to rule this out. Um, but you're right. I mean, one would maybe wonder if here such an isomorphism could exist, which is not an isometric isomorphism. Uh, so this is maybe the next question to investigate. Uh, we don't know, but I, my suspicion is that this is also not true. Yeah, so, so there should also be similar theorems, for example, with the, uh, in the Caesar algebra case, O3 tensor O4 is isomorphic to, is that right, to O2? Uh, yes, because the tor is zero and the tensor product of the groups is zero. <clears throat> and so presumably that's also not true in the LP case by some mm -hmm. sort of similar argument. Um, <clears throat> but now what about O3 tensor O4 isomorphic to O2 tensor O2? Um, right, good question. So the first one we can actually rule out. I mean, I we did this even in, in the paper. I mean, I, I didn't present you all the uh, things that we yeah, did. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, with, with essentially the same argument. Um, and the other case, um, that's, a, that's a very good question. I actually don't know. I mean, they also don't have a feeling. I mean, uh, this might actually possibly be, be, be true that they are isomorphic, the, these uh, two tensor products of one algebra that you mentioned. Yeah. 
I mean, you you will re presumably reduce it to some sort of groupoid question in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, it, it seems somehow that that uh, going to buy Lipschitz equivalents is a fairly crude thing to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I mean, I, I, I mean, my guess would be the answer should be no, they're not isomorphic. Um, and, and one would have to simply work on the topological groupoids to, uh, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, me neither. Uh, but yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, it, it seems we have a question from Niels. Uh, yes, um, uh, this is a much more basic question, I think. So you had this uh, notion of a core of your uh, LP operator algebra, right? Mm -hmm. And you said that was always uh, commutative. Yeah. And at the same time, it was a it was a largest C star sub algebra. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, you say if you just look at um, P greater than one, and you look at a, a capital LP on the unit interval, it contains um, a complemented copy of a little L2, right? So in other words, you can, um, that way you can embed all the C-star algebras into it, right? But not, not isometrically. So uh, everything that we do here is, is an isometric theory, not an isomorphism theory. Oh, so, I see. So, ah. so you're right that, that you can isomorphically embed uh, a C star algebra, but not isometrically. So that's ah. that's the point here. Um, right. Uh, that's that's why really insisting on um, isometry makes it a sort of a completely different uh, theory. Yeah, exactly. Sure. So Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, we know quite a bit about, well, I shouldn't say quite a bit. There's still, <clears throat> we, we know the beginnings of a theory of the isometric theory of sort of C star like LP operator algebras. Uh, the isomorphic theory we know basically nothing about. Mm, no, much less, yeah, for sure. Can, can I ask a question? Um, mm -hmm. Please, please. Would, would the, does K theory help with the isomorphic theory? Uh, actually, no. So uh, we uh, computed the K theory of, let, let's say, uh, uh, so these, these algebras here. Um, so the K theory is trivial. I mean, uh, Chris computed that, uh, and they. I mean, these are amenable. These are amenable, these are amenable simple um, Banach algebras with trivial K theory, and the tensor product of of this algebra with itself is, is the same. It's also an amenable simple um, Banach algebra with trivial K theory, uh, and never and they are purely infinite. Um, Yet they're not isomorphic. So this also tells us that there's no uh, Kirchberg Phillips uh, classification theorem. So if you know that from, from C-star algebras, uh, it, it tells us that, um, well, all purely infinite, uh, simple nuclear uh, C-star algebras are classified by their K-theory. Uh, and uh, one consequence of, of this theorem here is that there will be no such classification theorem uh, for LP operator algebras. So K theory is not a, a strong enough invariant to, to, to distinguish them. Yeah. Okay, many thanks. Do we have any other questions? Well, if not, let us let us thank Hannes for this splendid talk. Um, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> right. Um, let's...